going on, everybody? You're tuning into another episode of 2010 Minutes. I am your host, Tim McCarthy. Today we have on news reporter for WBZ, CBS Boston, and winner of the 2022 Miss Massachusetts pageant, Katrina Kincaid. How are you? I'm doing great today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. I appreciate that. Of course. Let's start off with this. What does mental health mean to you? To me, mental health means taking care of yourself the same way you would take care of your physical health. So a lot of times people talk about the fact that we take so much care, you know, we run to a doctor the moment, you know, we feel something ill, we talk to all our friends the moment we're like, I have a stomach ache, but we don't ever talk about that so openly in the same way when we're having a bad day or when we're anxious or when we're feeling depressed. And to me, mental health means doing those things. And it means taking care of myself and people around me in the same way I would take care of myself and them if they were physically ill. There's no wrong answer for that, but that's one of like the top answers I've, I feel like that I've gotten. Thank you. And I'm not just saying that either. I always like that question to start <laughs> off with. That's a great question. Let's go to the Miss Massachusetts real quick. How does one enter into the Miss Massachusetts? Do they see you and they're like, yeah, you're, you would be a great candidate for this. I, I, I wish. <laughs> I wish I got recruited like that. So for me, I had known about the Miss America organization since I was a child. I had been watching the competition on TV with my grandmother. And I also was like, how does one get into this? And so when I was in college, I was like, I'm really broke. I have so much tuition. What do I do? And the DC organization started putting up flyers around my school because they are a scholarship organization. And so I just emailed the flyer that I saw one day on a bulletin board. And I was like, hi, I would like to be interested, question mark. And that's how I got started in the Miss America organization. And then I did Miss DC for two years while I was in college at American. I'm American. <laughs> oh, yeah, just subtle. If you watch this on YouTube, it's a subtle little uh, brag over there. <laughs> if only I knew my left from right. Yeah. But, <laughs> but then I moved up here to be a news reporter, and I always wanted to be Miss Massachusetts. Like, I loved competing in D.C., but yeah. I wanted to go to Miss America representing where I'm from. And so I just started, and then the pandemic happened. But then I started again, and then I won. <laughs> That's awesome. And you were the first Muslim winner to win. How did that feel? I am. It felt really incredible. In the moment, you don't think anything. I, I think that... People are lying if you answer the question, like, what were you thinking when you won? And you have a coherent answer for that because I was crying. So I wasn't thinking anything other than relief, excitement. And then it didn't hit me till afterwards when I was sitting in bed. I had taken off the crown and sash. Like all night I kept looking down and being like, oh, and it didn't hit me until I was alone until I was in bed that night and I was like, oh my gosh, like I did it. Like I'm the first Muslim woman. I'm a black woman with natural hair up on stage. Like all these things that I hadn't grown up seeing on the stage that I did. I think it just really hit me. I cried a little bit, which is totally fine and normal, but it's just when everything that you've worked for to accomplish and the communities you've been aiming to represent and show positive representation for so long, to be the one to do it, it really, really touched me and made me not only proud of myself, but proud of my community. Was it one of those things going in that you knew that was a possibility or did you not find out after you won that you're like, holy crap, I was the first Muslim winner? Um, I knew going into it that if I had won, that I would be the first Muslim woman to win. Yeah. And last year, when I competed as Miss North Shore going into it, I actually was, I think, the first Muslim woman to compete in Massachusetts in general, because I showed up with my prayer mat, and we pray five times a day, and I remember asking and being like, hey, like, is it fine? Because they take your phones during rehearsal, but I was like, hey, I need my phone to pray, actually. And they were like, Oh, we've never encountered this before. And then this year I was so excited because when I filled out my preliminary information form, they added a line that said, is there any religious accommodations that we should know about that we should, you know, going into the competition week. And I just remember I looked at last year's paperwork and I was like, oh my God, that wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And, and realized it was because of just simple representation and me showing up and saying, you know, I'm a Muslim woman and I need the space to go about practicing my religion while being here in this competition. And so it, it just felt great. 
What goes into the competition exactly? Because I feel like a lot of people don't know. They probably just think it's just like looks or whatever. But what else is, uh, what does it entail? It is a lot. So the very first thing that you do is a private 10 minute interview with about five to seven judges. So imagine if you're at a, it's like a press conference style. So it's kind of, you're at a podium, there are five to seven strangers in front of you and they are asking you everything under the sun. Anything from current events, you do give them a resume sheet about you that they can ask questions off of. That's everything from fun facts about you to what are pressing issues you think are facing your generation. So you have a 10 minute interview with them and then you do a preliminary competition usually, which is a minute and a half talent, a onstage question, you know, where you like solve the world's problems in like 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what we have also in the Miss America organization is a pitch. So you do your social impact initiative, which is a cause or an organization that you want to champion and advocate for, for your year of service. And you pitch it basically to the audience, to the judges in again, 20 to 30 seconds about why it's important to you. And then we also have the red carpet wear, which everyone knows. What was your talent? I am a jazz singer. So I sang, I put a spell on you by Nina Simone. Mm, so they obviously love that. I, I think they did. You know, I heard some mixed reactions from afterwards, but here's what's important. I loved it. That's great. And I had fun doing it. And I think that that's what makes the biggest difference on stage between the confidence and the growth of, of people is when you're not performing for the judges, but you're also performing for yourself. That's probably why you won exactly. Now, did you think in your head that you were going to take it like at any moment you're like oh I got this in the bank or you got close you're like oh these girls had nothing on me like how was, how was that thought process I was more thinking about getting through each phase <laughs> cuz I actually this is going to sound weird but I don't like competing <laughs> I love the work that I get to do as Miss Massachusetts, as a local title holder, and the work I get to do in communities, but I don't like the stage portions. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It is intense, and as somebody who has general anxiety disorder, like, it's it's a lot. And so I was just focusing on getting myself through, and every time I'd come off and be like, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was, that was, you kind of have a shot at this one. Good. Good job. But I think it, it wasn't until I was standing there in the final two and holding Miss Boston's hands that I was like, oh, oh, you did really good. Like yeah. you and I saw like this judge just looking and like smiling at us. And I just looked at this judge and she looked at me and I remember being like, oh, my God, <laughs> I could do it. And and then they do this long dramatic pause. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then they called me and then I started sobbing. So there was no point in which I was like, I have all y'all. <laughs> yeah. but, but there were points in which I was like, I did that incredibly well. Also, I went first. So I didn't get to hear anybody's. Oh, that's that's like in school when you were the first one to go up with the school project. You're like, oh right. my God, I don't know if I'm going to do the same as everybody else. Right, right. So I, I had to come out the back being like, this has to be good because I got to make sure that anybody who follows behind me has a lot to, you know, get up yeah. there to. Wow. That's so I didn't really country. actually have the time to even think about what other girls had done. I only had heard it from other people afterwards where I'd be like, hey, how was blah, blah, blah? And they'd be like, oh, it was really good. And I'd be like, I don't know, because I'm changing into five billion things right now for the next yeah. phase. Yeah. Yeah. So you dealt with some anxiety. How would you explain anxiety to somebody that doesn't have it? For someone that doesn't have anxiety, how would I explain it? For, for me, well, for me physically, it's the tingles. So I I get this like, energy when I'm nervous and anxious throughout my all the way to my fingertips throughout my whole body and I have to do this breathing exercise which I've taught other people during the competition which is when you breathe and you let that breath go to feel that breath imagine it going all the way to your fingertips and I tell people that that is like how I feel all the time is is this feeling that's over my body that I have to consciously be like it's fine right. and imagine if your whole bodily is tingly but you don't know why but and that's that's how I would describe it because for me it's a physical it's a physical sensation and and it's mental but that goes back to the why in my brain I'm like why and I had a friend backstage kept being like just breathe you just need to breathe. And I'm like, well, you don't understand. I have an illogical <laughs> yeah. voice in my head telling me this is going badly. Despite the fact that everything, every time I get off stage, people are like, 
<laughs> and I would I say, imagine that you're doing something important, you're trying to focus, but your whole body is like is vibrating. That's how I would describe it. Yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty good um, explanation. I would be so worried about like what could happen, and then like I know we talked about this off uh, off camera here. It was the intrusive thoughts. Like if I was doing it, it's like, once if I just trip the girl in front of me? Like, like, <laughs> like what would happen if I just gave her a quick trip? Do you think she'd be out of there? Does that even I happen just, to you? I just think so many things. Like yeah. that's the other thing about anxieties. I have so many thoughts. And I think the biggest example that I just remembered, I remember I was backstage and I had answered a question. I didn't like my answer. And I came off stage and people were like, good answer. And I just, I kept being like, that was terrible. That wasn't a good answer. And I had to go get changed for talent. And I remember changing and talking to the girl who's helping me, being like, that freaking EPA question, I wish. And she was like, "It's you can't go back. You can't go back. You have to keep going forward. And I was backstage five seconds before I had to go on for this talent where I had wings and six-inch heels and had to remember how to spin going, okay, but if you had said instead. <laughs> yeah question and i i had to sit and do the breath with myself and be like katrina it's over that part, that's over we cannot change it stop thinking about it and that's anxiety yeah. like that is the anxiety of being like i can't get out these multiple multiple dimension scenarios out of my head for something i can't change at all whatsoever and now i'm slightly letting impact like what happens next as if i could change the past Former Miss USA 2019 Chesley Chris uh, tragically ended her own life due to depression. Being a fellow pageant title holder, how did that hit you? That hit me really, really hard because I looked up to Chesley. She was a black woman with natural hair who won a national title, then became a correspondent. Like She was yeah. absolutely everything that I looked up to and wanted to be when I grew up. And, and it hit me hard because... I was I was shocked, but we've talked about this a little. I wasn't surprised. So myself, I've dealt with high functioning depression, like Chesley's mom has come out and said that she had, and so I was shocked because when anybody commits suicide, you're going to be shocked that that person has has died and and chose to do that. But the surprise when I think you're somebody who is in the mental health community and has gone through that is not there as much because I remember thinking that could have been me at one point. Had I not done something, had I not gone to the mental hospital when I was in high school, had I not gotten a therapist, like I, I saw myself in her consistently living the life, doing the goals, being on TV, being a role model, being, you know, Miss America. And at the same time fighting all the inner demons that you have as as a woman of color as a woman as a pageant girl who should be you know perfect like i felt all of that at one point and to see that how how much that destroyed somebody on the inside and to see that they they couldn't seek help just broke my heart when i found out yeah we are pretty good at wearing masks people with uh, mental health issues and mental illnesses and we're very good at wearing masks we are we just we are I, and i think it's because of the stigma that we've talked about right yeah. like we don't we don't want people to see us without that mask and to and to think of us a different way is i think that that's a lot of what people especially with high functioning depression is you don't want people to think of you differently than the way that you already do and the way you've worked so hard to present yourself there's so many different battles with that because, again, you don't want to bump somebody out. You want to make sure you take care of yourself. There's just like a laundry list of things that make – just get, catch you like on the path, on the correct path that you want to make it. It's kind of bumpy. has a bunch of potholes in it, but you got to get through that, you know? <laughs> it's basically Storo Drive, yeah. Yes, exactly. Just <laughs> keep driving down Storo Drive and you'll be fine. You'll get uh, there. We, uh, you touched on it a little bit about your uh, childhood there, about with uh, mental mental health. What what made you become a mental health advocate? What led to that? So when I was about a sophomore in high school, I chose to go to a mental hospital. I had my mom drive me one night to the ER because I just wasn't feeling life anymore. And I and I put it that way specifically with that wording because when I've talked to other people about suicide and suicidal ideation. It looks so different for a lot of people. And I think that a lot of people have this stigma that 
if you are feeling suicidal, you have suicidal ideation, that you want to die. Like, you mm-hmm. want life to end completely. And I remember I wasn't there. I, I was in therapy. You know, I was doing things. I just did not like the way that my life was going in the moment. I didn't want to die. I just couldn't control the way I was living anymore and didn't find peace in that and was failing classes. I was not showing up for things and plays and rehearsals that I wanted to. And I remember being like, Katrina, this can't continue. Like this only gets worse. And so that night I had asked my mom to drive me to the ER. I remember not, to, I hadn't told my parents. My parents knew I was in therapy because they got a divorce when I was a, in my freshman year. But like, I hadn't even told my therapist. Oh, and wow. I remember I went to the mental hospital and my therapist called me on this, on this pay phone that was on the wall. And she was like, so what happened? And I was just like, what did happen? Like what did happen? And then through therapy, I got on medication at the time. I just remember being like, what happened is that, is that the facade broke? Is that I could not continue to do the things that I was showing everybody I could do while masking that there was very clearly to me something happening on the inside that was making intrusive thoughts, that was making random sadness, that was making, you know, me second guessing everything and all that pressure in my head that I wasn't letting out to anyone because I had had that mask up was just, was just gone. And I remember I became an advocate, really. I've been talking about mental health openly and in a fun way since that moment to make it, you know, conversational. But I didn't really realize the impact that that could have until I became an adult. And until recently, maybe like three years ago, where I was like, wait, I did not go through a unique experience. And that is what sucks. Yeah. And I, now having the platform where I can speak articulately about my experience and other people's experience, I want to use my skills that I've learned and the trauma that I went through as a kid to help other people understand where they're at and especially where youth are at. Yeah. Why is it that sometimes when we have a therapist, we don't tell them everything? Because I that was funny that you said that. I'm like, why am I so embarrassed <laughs> to talk to my therapist who went to college, has a degree? And I'm like, yeah, I shouldn't tell them that. Like, I why? agree. I think, I think it's the, the, the judgment. I think that yeah. even in the you're most vulnerable with someone you're paying to be vulnerable to. Yeah. I remember I had still up my mask for that person. And, yeah. I, and I don't know if that's because of the relationship that you need to build with your therapist if it takes a certain therapist to get that out, if that makes sense. So when I did um, an Instagram live series with a therapist before, something I'd never heard is a therapist said, it's okay to date around therapists. And I was like, excuse me, that is not okay. And she is like, that's not what I meant. And I was like, oh, <laughs> what do you mean? And she's, she was like, it's a relationship. You are building a relationship and open, a very open and trusting one more than most of your relationships probably in life. It's okay if that person isn't your person, isn't the yeah. person. And, and I think what's really hard though about that, because I agree with that, is that I was... 14 when I got my therapist and I loved the death out of her. I still remember Colleen today. I want to find her, but I can't like, but you know, it was hard for me to suddenly trust this woman with all, you know, I was, I was there to talk to her about my parents' divorce and boys, you know, not my head that didn't stop talking. And I think that a lot of times we go to therapy with something in mind And when things get more complicated than that, that's when we start to be like, all right, cut it out. When I told my therapist, because I shopped around too, the one I lost, the first thing I asked them, because I was like, there is no way, it's like with names or not, there is no way you don't talk about these stories to your friends and family. (laughs) And I was like, I was like, I need to know. Cause if they, I know they would lie to me if they said they didn't. Cause like, it's just natural. Like you you find something out at work. You're not going to say their name, but you can be like, listen to this crazy story. And I feel like they've done that. And she like, didn't say yes, but she was like, she like nodded a little bit. I was like, all right, we can definitely work together. Like I need a real person if I'm going to be real with them. Right. Right. And I, I think also for me, as I've, I've grown up is I need a therapist who is a black woman. And, and for me, 
when I was a kid, I wouldn't have realized that. I remember when I was a kid and I went through my evaluation, they put me with a woman because they were like, oh, you need more positive women role models in your life. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, I have role models. I love Beyonce. And they were like, no, you need like a woman who you can talk to and open yeah. up to. Because at the time, I didn't really have that relationship with my mom or really any woman. So they gave me Colleen. And I think now as an adult, I recognize that I think to be comfortable enough to talk about a lot of topics I want to and have somebody understand it on that level that I was like, I need a black woman. Yeah. And, and I think that's the important part about shopping around and being like, all right, I'm going to tell you this crazy story. How do you react to it? Because yeah. if you react to it, cool, then we're cool. But if you, if I see you getting skeptical, I'm going to have to find someone else. Yeah. I read that on articles too, is like uh, people of color have therapists that are people of color because obviously um, the same issues that come up, come up with, with, with racism. And that's actually great. Your transition game for me has been awesome. My, <laughs> next, my next question for you was how much does racism affect mental health? I think it affects a lot. I've, as a reporter, I've been lucky enough to do a lot of mental health stories about mental health in the black community, Latino community. And there is a certain cultural elements to mental health in those communities and communities of color that is different than white communities. And I think that that's why it's important that people of color can find other people of color who can relate to their issues and their traumas that they've gone through because of the fact that dealing with everyday racism, whether it be overt, whether it be something that we now have, unfortunately, access to see all the time on social media, really does hit a trauma in people of color, in black people. And I think that it is important to have somebody who can understand to the fullest extent your emotions. And sometimes when you're just speaking to a white person, they're not gonna have that. They're gonna have sympathy, absolutely. But when it's really affecting your mental health, you need somebody who is there with you, who can yeah. be in that moment and understand that. And I think that when it comes to racism, that is such a heavy topic that manifests in people of color in such different ways that it can be from religiously. I know a lot of people in the Latino Christian community have a lot of praying your mental health away. I've talked to them about that. And, and you know, you would need somebody mentally when you're seeking mental health that understands that and doesn't just kind of, you know, oh, well, that's a silly, you know, don't think of it like that. And, and I've met people and mental health professionals who are like, well, that's just so old generation of thinking. And, and that's not a culturally competent way of handling mental health and, and race and the intersectionality of them. Yeah. I think people get too weirded out when talking about race with someone who happens totally to be a different out. race. I think that's especially white people talking to us, say a black person about race. Why is that so awkward? You think for people, especially on the white side, <laughs> <laughs> Especially on the white side. I think it's because people don't want to offend people. You yeah. know, I think people would rather stay cautious and rather stay away from the topic and shy around it instead of just confronting it because they don't want to address it themselves. Whether that be, I have found that they think that maybe those things that you're talking about is applicable to them and they don't know how to handle that all of a sudden. Or they know it's not applicable to them, but still hearing that it's like, it's like white guilt. We talk about like when you're like, ah, oh, slavery and, oh, and a white person apologizes and you're like, did you enslave my, my family? Right. And they're like, well, no, but you know, I'm white. And you're like, that does nothing to do. With this yeah. And it's not fixing anything. They're not, yeah. Like, uh, thanks. But unless you're going to do some reparations, like, yeah. Why are you saying that to me? And I, I think that people are afraid of that. And like, to me, I find that hilarious. Like that's a, I would love that banter. But like some people, you know, find that incredibly uncomfortable. And, and I love the phrase, you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yep. But I think that when it comes to white people being cautious about discussing racism, I think it's because of that fear of being uncomfortable and bringing up topics that might force you to relook at your reality and the privilege that maybe you have had. I think realizing that racism is real is like the first step for people because some people think it's like fabricated or it's not real. I think that's to get on that topic is you just got to be like, yeah, it's real and we need to talk about it and help it down. So 
Yeah. Do you have any ideas or suggestions how we can break down racial barriers? I thought you were to ask me to solve racism. I'm like, yeah. no. Um, <laughs> <Solve> it, no. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't have that actually. Yeah. I can do a lot as Miss Massachusetts and Miss America, hopefully, yeah. but no, not that you'd, one. You'd make Miss Universe if you could figure <laughs> that one out. <laughs> I could solve racism all together. <laughs> Can you ask the question again? <laughs> yeah, I was like, what can we do to help break down racial barriers? I know you said like speaking about it with people, but anything else? I think to help break down racial barriers, I really think that it's also exposing people to more cultures. I think that especially in Massachusetts, even though Boston is now a majority minority city, I think that a lot of people can get trapped in their own secular small communities in Massachusetts and not branch out. Yeah. And so, for example, the other day I went to Open Streets in Dorchester, I believe, and it was a huge celebration and it was people from all different Asian backgrounds. I had never been to that before. Like, I had never been to some street food and performances happening. And it opened my eyes to completely new cultures and completely new people. And I think that one way that we can, you know, fight racism, break down racism is just exposing people to, yeah. to new cultures. I was in a program in elementary school that bust me from Boston as a black kid to a white school, not only so I could get an education, but part of the focus of the program written out was to diversify these schools to introduce people of diverse backgrounds mm. to white people. And, and I think it's stuff like that. Like it really is getting to know people and cultures eat like don't just like go out though and like make a black friend you know <laughs> yeah yeah but it's like, okay it, i'm not racist i got a black friend i got a black friend right exactly <laughs> like that like it's yeah. not that but it truly is wanting to appreciate other cultures and that's why when we say representation matters it's so that you can watch Encanto as a white person and be like oh like i didn't realize that religion or spirituality is so big in this it's just it's little exposure things that i hope i hope and i think will truly help break down some barriers for people yeah i'm a big culture guy my one of my um bucket lists is go to japan i want to go to japan. Oh, me too yeah, their culture is up there with some of the best i don't want to compare and contrast and say who's better than others but on my personal wish list i would love to go to japan it's pretty up there i was just saying that i I was asking someone the other day um, if we if they thought that we were going to get to flying cars. And, and they were like, why would we be there? And I was like, have you ever seen Japan? Like, yeah, have you ever just seen pictures of metropolitan areas in Japan? Like, I'm not saying they're there, but I'm saying if anybody's going to get there first, it's them. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. And it's funny that you say that with flying cars. Jo George Jetson's birthday was just recently, so he's being born right now. And by the time he was like 30, there was flying cars. So I think we're we're getting there. We could get there. I'm saying. Yep, yep. We already uh, have guys on one wheel scooter things, you know? That's the uh, way. unicycles? Yeah, no, no, you well, no, you know the ones that oh, look like a cardboard, yeah. but it's one and they usually have their arms like this. Yeah, it's like a skateboard, but which is yeah, one big wheel. Oh, one wheel. Yeah. Yeah. Those are weird. <laughs> Those are really weird. <laughs> <laughs> so you do a lot of work with the Special Olympics. Uh what made you get into that? Um well, it was fifteen years ago at this point that my brother signed up to be on a Special Olympics team with his elementary school at that point. It's so weird to think about because it's so it seems like it just happened and that we've yeah. just been involved, but to think that it's been fifteen years is really incredible. Wow. And my brother got involved as a special Olympian. He's on the spectrum and I started volunteering with his team in whatever capacity they needed. And then as I got older, I wanted to volunteer on the statewide level and my parents would like drop me off at state games so that I could just get this big oversized t-shirt and like walking around escorting people. And I just, I've loved it ever since I was a kid and the smiles and just the energy that the Olympians had that I now continued it into my adult life. I love it. That's a great organization to, to help with. You you do a lot of great things. I like, I like, I like you. You're a good oh, person. thanks, man. <laughs> I'll like you too. Thanks. So let's have some fun. I, you being a news anchor, it's mm. very weird to me that you guys have like the weirdest like dialect and i don't ah. know what, what is that exactly that you guys all talk like like just professional you were about to do it and i know I, I was too scared. I, 
It's too scared. It's like going up to like a rapper and you're like a SoundCloud rapper. You're like, hey, you want to hear me rap? Like, I didn't want to do that. I don't want to give my anchor voice to you. So <laughs> I was like, oh my God, he's about to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did it. It's okay. It made it by the end. So it's called the transatlantic accent. And it basically is enunciating certain words, putting your emphasis in certain places, slowing down the way you speak so that if somebody is watching, you know, they're fully ingesting every word you say. Yeah. So I like to say it's not too different than, or it shouldn't be. To do it well, it should not be too different from the way your voice normally sounds. Okay. If you start clicking into, I can't recognize you when I hear you, then I'm like, you're, you're acting at that point. And I think viewers love it more when, you know, you're you. Yeah. And so it's just basically, I'm trying to see if there's something anywhere on my calendar that I can read out loud. So like if I'm talking to you right now, when I see this, there's something that says Peter killed spider above door <laughs> <laughs> on, on my calendar. Um, in the transatlantic accent, I would say Peter kills spider. Peter kills spider above door. Yeah. Door okay. is the emphasis, you know? Peter kills spider, kills spider above door. Yeah, that's that's what door. Like, the way you door. said that, too, it just sounds like... Right, like, right, exactly. exactly. Like, yesterday morning, morning was the emphasis, Peter went and killed the spider behind the door. Yeah. You're, you're emphasizing the main points in your argument, right? So, like, in the morning, spider was at a door. Yeah. So that even if you're not really listening... You're like, spider door, Peter. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. If you use your real accent, like, killed, Peter killed the spider near the door <laughs> guy. And everyone in the news would be like, well, what? <laughs> so, but that's what I actually love about Boston. Like, you know, Dan Roach? Yep. He's, he has the accent. Yeah. And I remember the first time I met him in person, I was like, holy crap. You sound like my mother. Yeah. But you're on TV. <laughs> yeah, he gets away with it. That's awesome. Like, it's so Boston sports, you yeah. know? Like, I don't know if you'd be able to get away with that in, like, Boston hard news. Yeah. And that's what I love about sports so much, is I'm like, you you rep us like yeah. that, Dan. Like, you go. Yeah, you can't be given bad news with the uh, heavy Boston <laughs> accent. It just sounds too bad. I, I don't well, even want to give an example. Street. That's a really bad, wicked bad fio. Yeah. Hobbit Street, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was a murder. <laughs> a bad bad murder, <laughs> bad murder. <laughs> that's not gonna fly <laughs> so i found this out about you so oh, no. you str you're stranded on an island you get a box of the same donut <laughs> what donut flavor are you bringing with you one flavor one flavor from one yeah. place or can it yeah. be just oh. your favorite donut what is which one's coming it can be from anywhere it can be any type i just i just need to know the favorite donut, if I'm bringing and I'm stranded on an island, is the chocolate frosted from Backdoor Donuts on Martha's Vineyard in Oak Bluffs after 7.30 p.m. Wow. So what, do you got to wait in line for those? Yes. I just waited in line two days ago for about 30 minutes. Yes. Wow. That is so, but here's question. Well, here's the catch, though. They're hot. And, and I'm not waking up at 5 a.m. No one is. Is. you know who's waking up at 5 a.m for a hot donut so if you're out it's at night yeah. you're on vacation you're like do i smell fresh donuts at 7 30 yeah you have to and and they're so hot that you get the chocolate frosted one and it's pretty much melted i had to get my investigating news from 2010 minutes on that one so <laughs> aka I looked at your instagram bio and saw that you were a big donut person <laughs> <laughs> Yes, big donut person. Huge. I'm just a regular chocolate frosted guy across the board. If I go somewhere and there's a chocolate frosted, so that's right up my alley. There you go. That's my taste test, though, is that's what I get. It's either that or a strawberry frosted. As I <laughs> Anything artificial strawberry is disgusting. Okay, I don't, I don't disagree with you. Like, I'm not saying that's a good choice on my end. Right. I'm just saying what I do. Okay. Hey, I, I don't know. fitness, no judgment zone, you know? And so, so, but the chocolate frosted is the test. I just want, you want a simple, simple. Yeah. If you get complicated, then you start liking places because they have like extravagant, s'more, super jelly filled. It's like, no, yeah. if you're a good donut shop, you'll get the basics right. 
But the other side of it, if you get just a plain donut without like even a coffee, like you're a psychopath. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's unwell. <laughs> yeah, that's very. I have never and that one, that one in the coconut is always in the box with donuts. At least the coconut will get taken ah! at one point. But um, yeah, I, it's funny. No one in their right mind. I I'm gonna. No one in their right mind just gets a old fashioned no nothing with a donut you yeah. have to i'm sure that there's a trauma happening <laughs> that day to you where you want something so bland yeah just oh man i'll take a glazed donut any day over that but yeah that's uh you need to be making as unhealthy as you can <laughs> <laughs> that's where the baseline is like if you're like oh but the old-fashioned is like healthy like why are you at a donut shop right <laughs> so you have someone coming to Boston for the first time. What's a place, food place, or otherwise you would recommend to them that a lot of people from Boston may not even know about? I feel like on-field reporter, do you have anything? I do. I do. Um, and only people, I've only met a few Bostonians. I mean, I, I know a lot of Bostonians who know about it, but I've only really met a few who are like, yes, Bovas. Bovas. See, you said it. You don't know it. No. <laughs> Spova's Bakery in the North End is this tiny little bakery that's open 24-7. It is oh. one of the only, like, fresh bakery food places that is open 24-7 in the city. Not to bash them or anything. I feel like Mike's Pastries is, like, the big name that people go to. But the Bova? Yeah. Mike's is for the tourists. Yeah, that's right. Mike's is for the tourists. Modern is for the people who are like, I'm not like Mike's. I go to Modern's. You're yeah. still a tourist. If you're not a tourist, go to Bova's Bakery. It's on, I think it's on Prince Street. It's like a little corner shop. And it's open, there's no, it just says open 24-7. When is Miss America pageants going on? And you, are you entering? You have to, right? <laughs> yes, I do have to go. Massachusetts should be represented. Yeah. Uh, I will go. It is in December. Last year, it was around, I believe, the third week of December. They have not announced official dates yet because Mohican Sun, where it's held, gets to do the big announcement. So we don't officially know, but last year it was held during the third week of December. So I am tentatively planning for that. <laughs> oh, I'll plan for it too. I love gambling. I'll go down to Mohegan and root. Yeah. Down. I'll go down silly. there. That would be awesome. It's so, it's so fun. I think that a lot of people have like a misconception about, and I was just reading an article about, uh, from this woman who wasn't into pageants. Cause she was like, Oh, like my family didn't do that. You know, what are these girls out there thinking that they're better than everybody else on stage? And then they were like, and then I went to one and realized I went to Miss America and realized how much freaking fun it is to yeah. watch this competition like we're putting our lives on the line. On yeah. Yeah. And you end up hearing Right. And like you cheer for people you don't even know, you know, they don't win. You're like, what? Like it's, it's a competition. It's a yeah. live competition. Do you have any bad blood with any other states that you want to beat them just in case? Like in New York, you're like, I got to take out Miss New York. Like, is there anyone on the, the crosses? <laughs> no, I love Taryn. She's great. That's New York. Right. Uh, Taryn, I love, I don't have really any beef with anybody. I actually, unfortunately only, we just had a Miss America orientation just last weekend, but because I was working and then I had a vacation on the vineyard right afterwards, I couldn't take the whole week off to go to orientation like everybody else did. Yeah. So I only got to go into Dallas for orientation on Saturday. I had literally 24 hours to meet all the other 50 girls. And so I just am excited to keep getting to know them, which now it just has to happen over social media. Yeah, but cool. I don't know anybody enough to not like them. And nor do I think that since we're women all with the same purpose, yeah. would I not like anybody? I would like to see what what Miss South Dakota's up to. Like, I've, I feel like those random states, like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, wow. It's like, how many people do they have in that state? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, I, and I have just also just haven't traveled a lot around the country yeah. up further than the East Coast. And so I'm meeting people who like Miss Oklahoma. I love her so much. I don't think I would have ever said before, like, I have a great friend in Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like, who's in Oklahoma? What's in Oklahoma? Yeah. Or, I don't know, tornadoes. And, and she's a meteorologist in Oklahoma. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, she's one of my favorite favorite humans on this earth. And so I I think that's kind of cool to be like, what? 
you yeah. South Dakota up to? Like, what are you? Yeah, you should go up to her at the competition. Like, what's your deal? <laughs> like, what do you do? <laughs> this, this guy interviewed me, and he, we talked about you for a good five minutes, and we don't know anything about you. <laughs> she he just really wants to know, like, what happens, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm sure that, I mean, we had our first Miss America from North Dakota about three years ago, I think. Kara Mund was the first Miss America from North Dakota. Wow. That was really cool. Has a Miss I'm... Massachusetts ever won? No. Okay, so this is the thing. You have to go and win, obviously, for yourself, your family, your <laughs> friends, everybody. But you got to win for me, too. So, like, people will go back and be like, oh, wow, he interviewed her before she was Miss America. <laughs> so, like, I, like, I'm that guy when you buy an album and someone's like, oh, I like their earliest stuff more. Like, that's, <laughs> that's me with you. So just don't forget about me when you take home the, the championship. <laughs> <laughs> You're like original side copy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got the side eight by ten. <laughs> yep, yeah, exactly. So yeah, do it for all of us. I'm. Uh, I want to so badly. You know, that'd be, I. I that'd just, be awesome. I grew up watching us take so many L's. Like yeah, and, yeah. and always being like Massachusetts, and then she wouldn't get it. And I'd be like, what is yeah, happening? Yeah. Like I was like. Why? And I remember every year when I was growing up being like, when I miss Massachusetts, no more. Like, yeah. I'm going to do it. Like, I was like, well, every time she'd lose. And I'd be like, mom, like one day it's going to be me. And like, I can only hope and dream that it's me. But I think that there's so many reasons why I want it to be me yeah. that I hope the judges see that. Like, we've never had a Miss America with natural hair. We never had a Muslim Miss America. There are so many uh, gaps in representation that the Miss America organization is amazing at welcoming any woman who wants to be a part of it that yeah. I would love to see represented as, as the Miss America. Yeah, same. <laughs> same. <laughs> like a girl from Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah, throw it up. Throw it up. Bova. <laughs> and you can get sponsored by Bova. We can we'll make, this a big, we'll get, make this a big thing, all right? <laughs> We're, We're going to bring in all the sponsors from Massachusetts yep. and be like, we mm -hmm. have donuts. We have your bakery. Your dress is going to look like a NASCAR car. <laughs> <laughs> Just with stickers. Well, yeah. that's what, you know the, do you know about how we used to do a show me your shoes parade? No. So every year, and I think they're still trying to figure it out for this year, but since we're in the winter, it's a little hard. Miss America used to be held in September as a mark to the end of the summer season, but a yep. way for also Atlantic City to continue their tourism for a little bit longer. So what they would have is basically a convertible parade on the boardwalk. Each state would choose a costume that had to go with their state. And so mm. you you had shoes on, too, because it was called – people would be on the boardwalk and go, show us your shoes. So then it became a thing where you decorate shoes in a costume that represented your state. And I was like, oh, my gosh, if I can do this parade, yeah, I'm either doing Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, I want but not like it's not cute. Like I want I want campy. I want drag. I want a cup on my head, you know, yeah, like yeah, I, want, yeah, yeah. A crown cup. I want a Dunkin' iced coffee cup on my head. Yeah. Or. My other one that I love, I love the fairs that we have here. Like, I've been going to the Brockton Fair since I was a little kid. Oh, like the Moshfield Fair and stuff? Yeah, the Topsfield. Did you know the Topsfield Fair is the oldest state slash county fair in the country? I'm learning so much today. This has been great, and I did not know that, no. <laughs> so, as you know, usually it's an ode to your state in some in some way. You know, we yeah. invented Dunkin', we invented chocolate chip cookie. That was an idea of mine. But I wanted a giant Ferris wheel. <laughs> that's, hey, that's great. Not to stop you real quick, but that's funny that you say that. I'm originally from Quincy, which is where the home of the Dunkin' Donuts is. And it now, is! Yep, and now I reside in the town of Whitman that actually made the uh, Toll House cookie. You're in Chocolate Chip Cookie Land! Yep, they still have the uh, the original sign, but it's in front of a Walgreens now. But they have like a little plaque. I wonder if people from all over the world come over and be like, this is where the first cookie was. This is the cookie. Yeah, now they're in like Dallas or something. I was about to say, is there like an HQ there? No, it's got to be down there. But no, yeah, it's funny that you say both of those things. Like that's that's my uh, I rep those hoods. <laughs> <laughs> that's your that's your playground. Yeah, it's my playground. You know, cookies and iced coffee. I ask this to everybody, and it's perfect for you. So you're coming out. I usually say like, think about coming out to an arena, but you're coming out 
for Miss America, what is your theme song that would be played? It doesn't have to be your actual one, but what would be Katrina's theme song? Um, for coming out, like walking at Miss America, or my, you know, like like you come out, like think of it first, like you're a professional wrestler and like like baseball like, type thing. They play yes. that song yeah, before they walk come up, up song. that. Yep. Mine is "Moment for Life" by Nicki Minaj. I love how you had an answer right away. I I play it before every competition. That's I could awesome. rap the whole thing. <laughs> That's great. Now I'm gonna it's... I'm gonna play it to get pumped up that day. <laughs> I'm honestly I might come down. I'm not even kidding you. I might I honestly come done. down. Yeah, that'd be. A, I love going to novelty things. Like I went to '90s con one time. Like I want to go see things and do things. Oh, it's it's something to be seen. It yeah, is. I'm definitely is. gonna. You that. should. I'll send you all the info whenever Please. I get it. Please. It's going to be so fun. But it would be, if I had to choose a baseball walkout song, because I think about that, it would be a moment for life. Nicki okay. Minaj. But I love it. I love it. <laughs> now I end with this. What are three things that you're grateful for today? Today? In life? Or today? Yeah. The specific 24 hours. Let's do a specific 24 hours. So we'll put specific. the heat on you. <laughs> <laughs> specific 24 hours yep um i would say my cat nice i was just away from her for a week and i also brought her to college as an emotional service animal when i was nice. a freshman year and so i'm very grateful to just every day have her you know life's short with animals and i just every time i feel love from a cat i'm like, I'm like oh this is so nice yeah. um as i stare at a photo of her that i had printed out i <laughs> Um, I would say, yeah, I would say my cat. I would say my job. It is very stressful, and there are many days in which I question the path I am on. Yep. But ultimately, I told someone the other day, being a Boston news reporter is a goal I had since I was eight. That's awesome. I, I am living the two biggest dreams, other than becoming Miss America, that I wanted in life. And no matter how hard a day might be, how tedious work may seem, like I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing the dream that I wanted and at one point didn't think it was possible. And so, so my cat, my job, and the third thing today that I am grateful for, I would say would be the rain. Yeah. Not because of the drought. Because I mean, I mean like environmentally because of the drought, right? <laughs> but like, yeah. Yeah. But like for me, I feel like the rain, like a good rainy day is so peaceful and I feel more comfortable. This is like my anxiety and intrusive thoughts, but sitting inside when it's raining versus when it's sunny out, I'm like, I have to do something. Yeah. And, and I just like, I'm grateful that there is a day finally where I don't feel like I should be doing something because it's nice out, but I can just kind of sit and be like, no one's doing something right now. Yeah. It's uh, Missy Elliott's least favorite day. <laughs> she can't stand it, can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> Katrina Kincaid thank you so much for coming on thank you for having me this was so fun yeah definitely and that's another episode of 20 Tim Minutes let's break the stigma by cracking a smile see you next time <laughs>So I don't think I sent you the pre-interview uh, sheet that I do with people, um, but this is going to be good. I do a two out of three game of rock, paper, scissors to start off. We do okay. two out of three. You're going to call it. You're going to call it rock, paper, scissors, shoot. I'm going to keep my eyes closed to make it fair. There's a delay. So hands up in front of the camera, rock, paper, scissors, shoot, and two out of three wins. What am I rock, paper, scissoring for? Just uh, a win. That's that's all you you want to beat me in rock paper scissors. I, I'm, I'm glad that you asked because no one ever asked that and I don't know how to answer it. So it's just, it's just pretty much a good icebreaker to get going. But I like your I like your winning uh, mentality that you. Oh, I just wanted to know if I get a prize. Yeah, like loser has to shave their head or something. You know what I mean? Like I pick first question or something. Okay, so it's just do I close my eyes? You don't have to. You can. Okay. I'll close my eyes. All right, so just rock, paper, scissors, shoot, and then boom, we'll go from there. Two out of three wins. Okay, tell me what you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yep. are you saying rock, paper, scissors, shoot, or am I? You are. Okay, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Ooh, two oh, rocks. All right. Rock. Okay. All right, let's keep it going. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Ooh, one nothing you. One Woo! nothing you. Woo! Okay. All right. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh, no. You lose. You win. Lucky I didn't have anything at stake. 
You not you gotta know the trick. It's just, two rocks first, I feel like. Oh, I just I just go through all three. Oh, <laughs> I, mean, really? I didn't even catch up on that, so I, I can see why I lost. <laughs> I just go through all of them. Other than yeah, I just go through all of them. Yeah. Well, and then one randomness really. I realize that I don't think there really is a way to win. To strategically win. I think there is. There's like there's like competitions that people have and there's like multiple winners of like I don't know. People always ruin things. Like I just <laughs> have fun with stuff and people are like too good at something, you're like oh. That's how we get chess competitions. <laughs> it's true. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. If you are feeling suicidal, please dial 911.